Good morning. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, administration, faculty, staff, and students at the Alabama State University, welcome to 21st Century Activism. When the past meets the present, a social justice forum hosted by the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at ASU. More than six months ago, a collision occurred between two focusing events, a national pandemic and the clarion call for the end to social and racial injustice in this nation. Alabama State University is the epicenter uh, for the civil rights movement. The roles of the ASU students, faculty and staff played and shaped and propelled that movement onto a global stage. And so it is important that we begin this discussion so that we can come up with solutions to these very difficult challenges ahead of us. And so today I'm glad to invite you to sit back to engage this panel of change agents that will give us information that we can use to help make a difference and impact our communities. I'm thankful to the National Center and all of our panelists today for coming together as we begin a series of discussions about how we can impact not only our communities, but the state and the nation. So with that in mind, you all please sit back, relax, get your questions ready, and enjoy today's program. Hello, I bring you greetings on behalf of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University. We are happy to host this very special program today that speaks to our mission to serve as a research center, a living museum, and a repository of information important to the study of civil rights and African-American culture. We offer public programming that speaks to this mission while informing new research agendas and encouraging discussion around issues of social justice, civil rights, and the culture of African-Americans. Endowed by the National Endowment for the Humanities, 
our center offers a special focus on the history of Alabama State University, the university at the heart of the modern civil rights movement. We welcome you to our program today as we seek to preserve, reach, and teach the rich history and culture of African Americans. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Howard Robinson, Alabama State University archivist and historian. In today's forum, we will explore cutting edge approaches and solutions to some of the society's most perplexing and pressing challenges coming to us from agents of social justice. Today's topic of discussion, 21st century activism, when the past meets the present, will be addressed by our four distinguished agents of social justice. Our panelists include Dr. Artika Tyner, Dr. Gregory Vincent, Mrs. Dieta Jones, and Mr. David Hammond Jr. At this time, I'd like for each of our panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit about how their unique experiences speaks to the ideas of social justice, both in the past and in the present. We'll start with Dr. Tyner. For me, I'm honored to be here along with the esteemed panelists. And for me, what shaped who I am and why I became a civil rights attorney, a researcher, and someone who works and is deeply connected to advocacy in my community, whether it's related to policing or criminal justice or even our educational disparities, is being a daughter of Rondo. Five generations of my family have come from a community called Rondo. It's a historic Black community. It was the economic hub, the Tulsa. Oklahoma of Minnesota. And when we think about what happened to us and over a thousand communities across the nation with racial removal, we lost that economic hub overnight. And when I think about what is the spark and what ignited my passion is to ensure that we connect the past to the present and also to the future on how do we preserve and protect the rights of communities that they can remain vibrant, that they can remain strong and to be able to connect us as well the other piece of my work is connecting the work to the diaspora and connecting back to Ghana and building, my goal is to build a sister city from Minnesota all the way to Accra and then around to the Volta region. So connecting the issues globally around human rights and civil rights has been my life's mission. Dr. Gregory Vincent. Good morning uh, to President Ross, to Dean Franklin, to Dr. Uh, Roll. Uh, and to the National Center. Thank you so much for this most gracious invitation. It's an honor to be here along with a distinguished uh, fellow panelists. Uh, I currently serve as, the, as a professor and the executive director of the Education and Civil Rights Initiative at the University of Kentucky. This is a groundbreaking partnership between the university and the NAACP. I have uh, forged my career in two areas, uh, civil rights law and in education. And this um, marries um, the, the inspiration I received from uh, civil rights giants like Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall. Uh, when the NAACP was looking to dismantle Jim Crow segregation, and of course, Montgomery and Alabama State were at the center of that, there were so many issues to address. Lynching, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, uh, 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 labor, uh, criminal justice. Yet they focused primarily on education because they understood that if you have a, a quality education, you can fully participate in our democratic society. And I look to continue uh, that work and that legacy. Mrs. Dieta Jones. Thank you. I want to echo the, the comments of uh, some of the other esteemed panelists and say thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this really um, amazing um, experience and also at a time that is so pivotal, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. Um, I am a founder and CEO of a consulting firm that focuses on equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy. 
I've been doing the work of equity and um, activism for about 30 years. I started as a student, and so I have an incredible passion for uh, the power of young people in being able to articulate and drive a bold agenda. Um, it was definitely part of my own life's journey. And so anything that I can do to, to help to promote that, but also enable that, uh, those young voices is incredibly important to me, as well as being able to work with executives and decision makers and policy makers to make so sure that um, opportunities for dismantling uh, structural barriers uh, is something that is happening at multiple ends of the experience. I started my work um, as an activist uh, at a university level. I worked to change policy around hate crimes um, at, uh, in my local regional community in Colorado. Um, I went on to be the human rights director and uh, continued my work um, into uh, now being an entrepreneur who really is thinking about and trying to create ways for uh, black business owners and others to make sure that we have opportunities to position ourselves for uh, long-term sustainability and impact. And finally, Doc, um, Mr. David Hammond, Jr. Thank you so much. Um, uh, like everyone else, we thank you for allowing me to be uh, on this panel and all of us on this panel. I'm definitely honored to be around so many uh, great people uh, that have done you know, so many great things when it comes to the African-American culture. Uh, I am David Hammond. I serve as the 2020-2021 Student Government Association Executive President. Um, and like I said, I'm honored uh, to be a part of this uh, discussion and just ready to dive in. Okay, well, ho hello everybody and welcome. Today's conversation will last about an hour and will be divided into three segments. So the first segment will be the history of structural racism. The second segment will deal with contemporary social justice strategies. And the third segment will deal with future strategies for achieving social justice. So after the panel, I wanna remind everyone, after the panel, we'll have a question and answer session. So during the discussion, please post your questions in our chat box and we will address those questions as time permits. So let's jump right into our discussion. I want to first, of course, start with this idea of structural racism. And, and for the purposes of just getting our conversation started, I'd like to direct the question to um, Artika, Dr. Artika Tyner, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, maybe define for us structural racism and, and, how, and how it's applied and, and some examples of that. Yes, when we think about structural racism, I think we first have to think about it in the sense of what is racism? If we build a working definition, we know that it's power plus prejudice. And then putting that into the context of history, of looking specifically, let's ground it in the conversation of the United States, we then know that when we put history together, that the structures, and I'm going to talk about it personally as, a, as an attorney and as a law professor, and the sense of laws and policies then connecting for structures and institutions to bring forth and serve as that vehicle to make racism materialize. And the added component that we don't want to miss that the ideology that informs that is white supremacy. So when we put those together, I also, I, when as I was thinking about this question, I, I thought of my parents. Um, one of the things that I do with a business venture is investment real estate. And I remember I purchased the property and my parents were pleased, but they said one thing, you look at the foundation. So you made sure that the foundation was strong. And if we look at the foundation of America and we ground it in, whether we're looking at the research from the New York Times and the 1619 Project, or even looking at our very own constitution that we come into being as black people through amendments to the constitution, we know that then the structure, the foundation has been laid around race as we look at it in terms, not just as the past, but as the present, and the challenge for us today as we go into the dialogue is how to examine it for the future. So just by working definition, um, one of the definitions that we set forth of structural racism is from the Aspen Institute. And it reads, it's a system in which public policies, institutions, practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. Here's the challenge for far too many of us, we think about racism as it relates to individuals. 
we think about those face-to-face -face encounters or even those covert actions and we're starting to look at it in multiple dimensions whether we're saying it's related to bias or prejudice or even looking at microaggressions for instance but i challenge us for today to focus specifically on the systems because oftentimes when i do this work around equity and teaching and training folks around civil rights advocacy they focus right away on an individual act but really the reality is if we want to manifest change we have to understand how the systems of oppression and marginalization work with the force of law and policy so i was asked to look at, it, at an example as you heard in my introduction i'm from the state of minnesota if you look at anything that identifies minnesota you have us as number one in out of many all the states then around quality of life um i was just reading the reports we're the number one state to raise a family we're the number one happiest place in the nation i don't know how you measure that and we're number six as a place to live the best place to live in the country according to the u.s and world news report but the reality of it is i often talk about minnesota as a tale of two cities and it's not just minnesota it's nations or it's across the nation that we see this dilemma because then once we put in the component as it relates to African-Americans, the poverty rate for African-Americans here in Minnesota is four times the poverty rate of the majority of uh, white Americans. It's at 5.9%, but 25% for African-Americans. And if we think about education, as Dr. Um, Vincent talked about, we have a real challenge when we are dead at the bottom, number 50, if we look at educational attainment, once we put in the components of race. So how could this be that one state that applauds itself and says, oh, we're one of the most progressive states, we are doing great work, we are the home of a great number of Fortune 500 companies, so we should not be experiencing this level of poverty and these levels of disparities. You cannot explain it. I cannot say that it's just one person who's maybe influencing hiring practices. I can't say that it's just maybe one politician. When you look at Minnesota then as a case study, you see that embedded in our policies and laws, and I'll give you one example because I've worked and spent most of my life on criminal justice issues. Before you give us, um, Dr. Tyner, before you give us an example, I, I, I'd like to, to, to make the conversation um, a little more organic and I'm going to pose another question. We're going to get to those examples. And so at, 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 at a further part in the program. But what I'd like to do is, um, is, is pose another question, but I want the panel to be able to jump in. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna call on any one person. If you, if you feel like you wanna answer this question, it, it, it speaks to your particular expertise, please, please jump in. But I want us to look at, um, it, it, you know, is structural racism you know, the best way to understand of the issues that are facing African Americans today and in the past, so so I'd like any one of you all to, to speak to the to that particular issue. Um, so uh, one of the best indicators of that is that we see a growing number of jurisdictions uh, where I spent some time, Franklin County in Columbus, Ohio, that have identified. Uh, racism, structural racism as a public health crisis. And so that's one example. And so I wanted to give a kind of center that in the, in the present, but then go back just for a quick moment. Yes, uh, structural racism, uh, as Dr. Tyner mentioned, are those systems and practices. And I just wanna just give a, just a very quick timeline. There is only a sh small slivers of time where African Americans have enjoyed some semblance of full participation in our democratic society. And we actually had, there were more laws that, that restricted our rights rather than it expanded them. So you had, of course, the notorious 1856 Dred Scott case that said that, that we, we did not, we're not entitled to citizenship. And it took a civil war and a radical reconstruction um, movement. And so again, just to center that, we're really talking about from 1865 to 1876, so 11 years. 
This is where those laws, those amendments that Dr. Tyner referenced, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, eliminating slavery, full participation in, you know, among states, and then the right for Black men to vote, right? So that happened 150 years ago, 11 years. And then you saw the retrenchment, the terrorism, and all the things that we talked about that really started to occur between 1870 and, again, going to that notorious Plessy v. Ferguson decision. Now, I should note that during those 11 years, there was amazing progress that was made in states like Mississippi and Alabama and, and where you saw participation. And that's why, for example, Senator, um, nom, um, the uh, candidate for the Senator of Mississippi, we had senators in states like South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, that retrenchment, that terrorism, the black codes were so powerful. So it took Again, from 1954, if you want to start the Brown Board of uh, Education decision and all the great civil work that was done in Alabama, particularly in Montgomery, to start the movement, just to really start things going. And it took the 1965 Civil Rights Act for us to begin to have those rights. And I should mention, of course, that in 1920, women finally got the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. So we've had these small slivers of time. So then if you mark 1965 to today, we, we began to have some real progress resulting in the election of President Barack Obama. However, we see that retrenchment again when you see in 2013, you had another notorious decision, the Shelby v. Holder position, um, uh, decision that gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights mm -hmm. Act and has, has allowed some of the voter suppression that I know we'll get into in a minute. So in, in all of our time, in all the time of our this great democracy, we perhaps had 50, maybe 70 years of some semblance of progress in, in the over uh, 200, 225 plus years of our existence. So less, of, less than a quarter of the time have we fully participated in our democratic society? And I will tell you that that's at risk even today. So I just wanted to give some timeline as to where we are. I see. Um, I would like, um, as the SGA president and, and really as our representative of, of a younger generation, um, Mr. Hammond, if you could talk a little bit about how you think young people, yourself, other young people, how they see this idea of structural racism. Do they see that? Um, as a barrier to or an impediment to the things that they want to do? Do they recognize sort of the elements of, of structural racism in their lives? Could you speak to, speak to that to some degree? Um, yes, sir. I think that we recognize it, but the question is, when do we recognize it? Um, I didn't really start recognizing it until I got into, you know, my older ages uh, uh, while attending Alabama State and being educated in, you know, all of my different courses and being more uh, engaged in the political realm and, you know, just the outside realm in general. Um, I definitely feel like we recognize it, though, as young millennials and, uh, and, and, and being in our communities. We think that it's in our backyard. In some cases, it is happening in our backyard from some of our students. Um, so I definitely think that we're recognizing it, but the main focus is when are we recognizing it? When are we recognizing it? Like I said, for myself, um, it wasn't until I got into college to where I was more engaged in wondering why and things of that nature. Um, just to round out this section of our conversation, um, I'd like to turn to, to Ms. Deanna Jones and, and just have us speak. Could you speak a little bit to this idea of, of these systematic discriminatory practices? And, and do, you know, some people might suggest that this is um, episodic or, or, or an individual um, um, manifestation. But, but others would argue, and I think our panelists are arguing that this is systemic and, and um, institutional. Could you talk a little bit about that um, it's, it's yes. for our audience? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is interesting because I've spent so much of my career um, educating individuals on how to identify their own biases and overcome their own biases. But if it was just about um, well-intentioned individuals being a little bit more competent here or there, we would have dealt with this by now. There's enough 
um, people who have been putting in work for a long time that if there weren't structural barriers in place, we put we would have made more progress than the kind of episodic progress that were just, that's been uh, um, described here. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Vincent, for giving us the timeline. So I absolutely agree with um, with you, Dr. Tyner, that the real emphasis and the real opportunity is to think about what the structures are and also to think about the individual acts and agency that we do have that's so powerful for us to see. So um, much of my work is in organizations, all sorts of organizations, um, elementary and K-12 environments, university environments, corporations all across the world. And the thing that's so heartening is that there are um, not just people in senior level decision making roles, but there are so many young people who are at very early stages of their life and also of their um, of careers who are taking active stances. So for example, in the advertising industry, young people who are creatives, which makes up a huge swath of our population in the entire world, are saying, we're going to stand up to this entire industry. It's a very, very large, multifaceted industry. We're going to stand up and we're going to say, we see the structural racism. We're going to describe to you not just what the barriers look like for us, but specific things that we are asking of you. And then really holding um, their leaders accountable for making transform transformative change. So that kind of collective voice that's happening from young people where they're not just identifying some of the structural barriers like you were describing, Mr. Hammond, but also being able to articulate that and then in a collective way, call those out and hold our leaders accountable for it. That's the thing that's really powerful about what's happening right now. You know, and, and I, I think we laid some foundation, particularly talking about this idea of, of structural racism and, and those issues that that are embedded in this community, in this society, and that that people have, and that people of African descent have been attempting to overcome for some time. Well, I want to move now to these tr traditional and both contemporary social justice strategies. I think um, um, Mrs. Dieta Jones touched on that, but I want to get into a, a, a little more um, detailed conversation about um, how do, how do we define the, our response to to um, structural racism in um, social justice and, and, and the social justice strategies. So if you could continue, actually, um, Dr. Tyner, or let's, let's talk, Dr. Tyner, if you could get into, just to, just to, to define social, to social justice strategies and, and approaches, both in the past and as we're looking towards moving, moving forward. Yeah, so when we think about social justice, it adds an extra component to justice as we know it. Justice we think about by definition of a fairness, but as we take on the components of social justice, I think it takes us to the next level that um, you're getting outlined and, and Mrs. Jones was starting to give us a sense of is that it's multifaceted. We have to think about if we're going to examine the structures, what's the data? What's happening? What are our goals? What do we seek to accomplish? We have to engage individuals while also challenging systems. So once we put in that definition of social justice, we're thinking about quality of life indicators. For instance, I remember when I was doing my dissertation research, one of the things that I looked at was the human development index from the UN. And when I started to put in the components of African-Americans from the past to the present, one of the things that was very alarming to me despite all the goodwill that we have and those individuals that Mrs. Jones was talking about who've taken a biased training, we still, in most quality of life indicators, we are faring either worse or the same than if we compare ourselves to even 100 years ago, more or less 400 years. And so when I think about this social justice component, I think we have to add in addition to a civil rights lens, a human rights lens, as we're talking about equity, as we're talking about access, and it must be data-driven and it must be intentional. Otherwise, it's easy to just dismiss it and say that it's about one individual living in poverty or one individual experiencing healthcare disparities as related to COVID, instead of looking at collectively and how it's impacting African-Americans as a whole. Let's, let's look at um, approaches that have been traditionally most effective in, in, in impacting or addressing stru um, structural racism. And any one of the panel could chime in on this. What, what, what have we traditionally done that you think has been particularly effective in addressing um, issues of structural racism? 
So, Dr. Robinson, I want to build on uh, what Dr. Tyner uh, shared and, and really make three three points. Um, I want to distinguish between what is legal and what is just, because um, and again, Montgomery is such an important part of that with the bus boycotts and and, and Rosa Parks and, and and Dr. King and so many others who were deemed to be breaking the law. And I just want to remind our viewers that some of the most heinous acts in modern human history were committed under a legal regime, whether that was slavery, Jim Crow, state-sponsored segregation, the Holocaust, apartheid. All of those things were committed under a legal regime. And so I really appreciated this point um, that we can't just look at what the law is. We have to say what is just um, from a moral, a human social dimension, right? And I think we have to always fight against being put in this narrow box. Um, because when we talked about, Dr. Tyner talked about going over to Ghana, one of the things that was so um, uh, pressing to me was that during, right, right above the slave quarters was a church, right? And so this idea that uh, that we, we have to uh, fight against that. So the first thing we have to do is fight against these norms that, that, that normalize this, this, this behavior. That's the first thing. The second thing is I think the person that so embodies um, these, these um, strategies was Representative uh, John Lewis, right? Of course, who was such a pivotal figure in, in um, Alabama and beyond. But he was both a social activist. He was a young student like Brother Hammond, who was, you know, was so involved and engaged, like so many students, freedom writers who were part of that. And one of the things I always want to say to my young brothers and sisters, you're, don't ask for permission to get involved and engage. If you see something, get involved. Um, don't wait for permission. Um, and so the most important thing that John Lewis did after, um, right before his death was connect with young people. He also was a lawmaker, right? And so as a member of Congress, he passed legislation. So I think it's this multifaceted approach that's been mentioned of both activism in the streets and in the halls of justice. So it's not either or, it's both and, and we need everyone, and especially for the young people, take Representative Lewis's call and, 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 and make this movement your own. You, you know, and, and we talk and celebrate um, I, I, the, the modern civil rights movement or the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. And really, over time, the, the efforts of people of African descent to move this nation forward and to unshackle um, black people in, in the United States. But one of the things that, um, that I think is clearly evident from today's protest is that, that, that this work has not been finished. And so what I'd like the panelists to address now and it is where has where have we fallen short in the past? Where have social activism not really accomplished the goals? And where do we see the most um, ground that needs to be made up today, and, and the most change that needs to be effectuated today? Can I jump in? I don't. I I think that the the take I want to the take I want to the way I want to answer it is slightly different than the way you pose the question, and it's really about the the unique opportunity that we have because we are sitting at the epicenter of three major cultural transformations that also happen to be affecting the entire world, right? So the racial equity movement that we're in right now, the whole world is involved with that. I personally have spoken with tens of thousands of people over just the last several months who are standing in solidarity with the United States and black folks in the United States, even if there are um, social justice issues that they're dealing with in their own countries, South Africa, Brazil, New Zealand, et cetera, they're standing in solidarity with the United States. That's really powerful. We also have a, a global pandemic and we have climate change. We have these major transformative things that are happening that are forcing a new conversation and forcing people to not be able to opt out. It's not an option, right? And the other thing that we have the opportunity to take advantage of now are things like social media. So, you know, we are able to not just, um, we're able to, to keep this on the news cycle. We're, there, there are, every single person is a journalist. Every single person is able to be an activist not just in our local communities, right? We're not just giving kind of local stories about here's what happened in this specific town. The entire world is able to see 
and also share stories and then create a, a collective action response. And I think that that's the opportunity that's different than in the past, right? That we're, we're global. We are not able to opt out. The world is transforming whether or not we like it. So opting out is not an option. And also that every single person is empowered to be an activist. So those to me are pretty powerful opportunities for us. Did anybody else want to chime in on that, on that idea? Um, I, I do want to remind our audience, the people who are viewing, that please, uh, one of the things that I think um, Dr. I mean, that, that Mrs. Deanna Jones is talking about is this very, is this very platform and this very forum, and that, and that now part of that is that you, the audience can engage um, the speakers and, and and ask questions. So I would like people to take advantage of that opportunity and and post your questions, and and we'll address those questions later on in, in, in the in the program. But um, I, I'd like to, to I'd like for you, Mr. Hammond, to to talk a little bit about um your position as a as a leader at Alabama State, but also you get to feel for students who have traveled to, to their to their respective hometowns um, during the pandemic crisis when school was shut down, and then participated in activism and protest, and then have come back and shared some of those stories. I'd like for you to talk about um, you know, your sense of their participation and student participation and young people's participation, you know, in, in these um, social change um, act, activism or movements. Uh, yes, sir. Um, like I tell people uh, a lot when I sit down and talk with them, um, I'm definitely uh, grateful to be the SGA president in this unique time. Um, I was elected in the midst of a pandemic and uh, during things, you know, when a lot of things were going on uh, in America, you know, and having these students being able to reach out to me, they know I have a open, I'm an open door uh, policy uh, person. I, I'm an open, anything you ask me, you come to me, we can have those uh, dialogues. So, you know, hearing those students saying, you know, they were involved in different protests, they were involved in these marches and these meetups and just hearing their experiences from it was was just amazing. I had a student uh, from Atlanta. Uh, she FaceTimed me you know, of her walking uh, while they did an HBCU march in Atlanta, and just to see uh, the unity of everyone peacefully protesting. Um, and you know, it, it was some you know students that unfortunately they were in some of those protests that had tear gas thrown at them and all of that to create you know a, a sense of. Uh, they 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 felt horrible about it, you know, saying, oh, "Well, I shouldn't went out there," and you know. But I'm like, no, you you march for a purpose. Uh, so that's what I'm glad about my student body is that they're engaged in what's going on in America, and they're just not sitting behind a keyboard writing on Twitter, uh, writing on Twitter a name. They're just not sitting uh, saying, you know, put these people in jail or this isn't right, this isn't right. But they're out trying to create change, trying to be change agent uh, in their respective places, in their respective towns, and even having that same mentality when they get to Montgomery. Uh, I know students that are from Montgomery that, you know, participated in some of the rallies at the state capitol and spoke at some of the rallies and all of that good stuff. So uh, that's one thing that I'm grateful for, that we have students that are willing to go out uh, and, and walk and march and, and stand in solidarity uh, with one another uh, against everything that's been going on. Dr. Hammond, you know, I want to turn to you a little bit. You have the, a unique perspective in that you have approached, I think, this issue of um, social justice and, and change through both um, education and the, um, and the law and the courts. Could you talk a little bit about fighting this battle on, on several fronts or multiple fronts? Did, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. 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 Hammond. I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Um, Vincent. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things I really want to pick up on the spirit of, of what uh, uh, Sister Jones said around um, reframing this question, because too often we frame this from a deficit mindset, you know, what what's wrong rather than the things that we've done. And I want to give a shout out. And this really, of course, includes Alabama State to the enduring institutions that have lifted and advocated for the permanent interests of black people. You know, even in the face of, of, of severe domestic terrorism, 
we created institutions that thrive to this day. Alabama State being a great example, our historically black colleges and universities, the black press, black businesses that were, again, many of those were uh, destroyed in acts of terrorism. I'm glad shows like Watchmen are bringing um, some attention you know, to that issue. Our faith communities, um, our advocacy organizations, the National Medical Association was established in 1895, 30 years after slavery. We had black doctors and lawyers come together. The NAACP, the Urban League are all over a century years old, our fraternities and sororities. So we, we have we have addressed that issue. And one of the things I want to make sure I get this right, one, uh, 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 one of my uh, dearest friends, and he's a faculty member at Howard University, he wrote this book, and I want to make sure I get the name right, so I'm going to quote it. it the, the, the name of it's called No BS, and it's called No Bad Stats. And I want to read it to say, Black people need people who believe in Black people enough not to believe every bad thing they hear about black people. And I bring that up to say that we got to reframe this. Anytime we, we, someone tries to throw negative stats, I'm not trying to say that, in, 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 you know, that, that some things aren't correct, but we got to reframe these discussions in a way that empowers us, that, that inspires young people like Brother Hammond to do this work. Because I will tell you that this narrative that you know there's something um, pathological about the black community, it, it just doesn't bear out. And where we certainly have incredible challenges. So one of the most radical things in my opinion we can do is, is claim our greatness, um, build on the institutions that are already here and present um, and fight for those institutions that have advocated for us for centuries. So I just wanted to put that put that in there. Now, as far as the law goes, you know, we have these incredible traditions of advocacy, both at the state level and the federal level. And I would argue that Charles Hamilton Houston and his protege, his mentee, Thurgood Marshall, were two of the greatest lawyers in his <clears throat> in history. And they created a legal, uh, almost a four decade legal strategy to dismantle Jim Crow segregation and were successful at that. That served as the inspiration for other movements. Ruth Bader Ginsburg took that on as, as an advocate for the women's rights movement in addition to many other movements. The environmental justice movement that was mentioned earlier was, was part of that as well. So there's been a rich legal tradition of, of us moving forward, but it took courageous young people, women, um, uh, and, and others to, to, to do this work. And so there's no one strategy. It is legal. It is advocacy. It's economic. You know, th there's a, I think, a compelling legal case for reparations that needs to be explored. So I, I just wanted to kind of share that. But the most important thing is we have to honor and, and advocate and, and invest in the institutions that have protected and advocated for us and continue to promote our permanent interests. I, I, I do want to, and, and what you say reminds me of something that I think Dr. Tyna has been involved in, and that's with the Rondo community. And, and so we, we had these, African-Americans had these communities and enclaves that were, that were a, a mix of um, business, um, entrepreneurial activities, um, you know, social churches, um, a, a whole vibrant um, network of activities and organizations and institutions and businesses that 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 were the, the center of black community in, in Montgomery. It was it was the, the Centennial Hill and, and Monroe Street and in Atlanta it was Auburn Avenue. Um, and, and, and so this is it repeated itself, it repeated itself around the nation. But 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 obviously you um, were, were nurtured in the Rondo community and and are involved in sort of a rebirth of that community. Could you talk to us a little bit about that project? Dr. Tyner, I think. Yes, for me, it was what inspired. Yes. It inspired me to become an attorney. It inspired me to become an, an attorney today, but but one of the answers is related to that we must use a multifaceted approach 
My work is not just simply as an attorney. I also am actively engaged in legislative advocacy, policy reform, and in fact, the class that I teach annually is administrative law on how to change rules and regulations on the ground. So when I think of the question of how do we connect the past to the present, my Rondo experience has taught me that I must be knowledgeable of my history. Like Marcus Garvey gave us a sense of, we can't be those trees with knowing our roots. So I understand the power of economics and cooperative economics in the Swahili sense of Ujamaa. I understand how that ties together. So if I look at the lessons that I learned from the past that carry us not just through Rondo, but across the black community, is understanding that I need a multifaceted arsenal. So that is not just, um, oftentimes when I talk to students, they say I can protest and they think that that's the only thing that's available within their hands. It is an important tool, but there are other tools. What about Operation Breadbasket and Dr. King's agenda around, we won't buy where we cannot work. So when we think about this, my hope for the future is that we have a multifaceted strategy. I was talking about criminal justice earlier. When I think about where I've been able to really make a mark in criminal justice reform, yes, it has been to help my individual clients, but it's also been able to challenge the systems around it. For instance, last night, there's one particular stock that last year this time went up about 100%. Not sure if you know what it is, but it's called Core Civics. If you look at it as face value, you think it's about community education. It's really about prison shareholders investing in private prisons. And if we connect the dots, if I'm only concerned about representing my clients, I won't understand how now prisons are on the stock exchange. I won't understand how companies like Global Tel Link and Securus make money off every phone call. Why am I paying 20 to $25 for a 15 minute phone call into prisons? So I say this and give this as an example because I think the lesson that I take from the past, whether it's my roots in Rondo and rebuilding the community epicenter of our work. And if I think about it specifically, the question is, how can I be multifaceted in my work? How can I understand the history from whence we've come to be able to draw upon it as my strength and my advocacy? So I advocate in the courtroom. I advocate outside of the courtroom. I advocate in C-suites. I advocate in every area, but I must take the time to understand my strategy on how to do so. Uh, I, I think that, and I, I want to, as we prepare to transition to, our, to the last phase of our conversation, probably the most important phase when we look at future strategies and, uh, for achieving social justice, I, I want to make that transition um, looking somewhat on, on um, Dr. Vincent alluded to institutions and, and, and part of that allusion we also included um, communities. But in institutions, um, of course, historically black colleges come to mind. And um, I'd like, I'd like for uh, Deetta Jones to talk a little bit about, um, and, and I, I think Deetta Jones and um, Dr. Tyna could talk, talk, talk about leadership and, and the, the importance of HBCUs in providing the type of leadership that, that moves us into the 21st century and, and embraces this newer agenda, um, all these, these variety, a variety of approaches to social change. Yeah, I, I'd love to. So I, uh, I absolutely am in love with the idea of thinking about the multiple ways in which we can and should be um, kind of activated and activating as agents of change. And so, and Dr. Tyner, you didn't mention it in your last uh, set of comments, but earlier you mentioned that you also um, are in real estate, right? All of those are things we can purchase real estate like in the communities where we live. We can contribute. We can collectively go in and purchase real estate so that we have um, start so we start to amass wealth. That's how wealth is grown, right? And so for us as black folks, how is it that we can think about all of the different ways in which we can potentially have an impact? As a black business owner, one of the things that I've been most pleased about is how um, there are actively identified and cultivated and shared lists of other black business owners. And then people are making choices. I am actually going to spend my dollars hiring black folks. As a business owner, I look for black folks to hire. I discriminate actively. I actively look for hiring people who are black, who can um, bring in the richness of the black experience and the black perspective. 
And what better place to find people who are incredibly talented and skilled and black than at HBCUs, right? And people who have had the HBCU experience. I personally did not go to an HBCU as an undergraduate. And it's one of the things that um, I, I actively as an adult caught up on and said, how is it that I can learn as much as possible um, and also um, expose my own child and also myself to richness associated with an HBCU experience? Because it's, it's in an HBCU environment, unlike so many other environments, I think that a lot of black folks have a true sense of belonging in a way that we don't have in so many other parts of the world, unless we come from a community like Congo, right? I, I so I think about that opportunity. Ms. Jones, I understand that your husband had a pretty uh, interesting experience at HBC. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. So um, <laughs> my husband is uh, he's in the Hall of Fame, uh, the uh, National Football Hall of Fame uh, now. But he, he came from uh, Atlanta. He was uh, not good enough to make the high school football team or the college football team. But he had a real active community of people around him, all black community, who said, you know what? We're going to help you. We're going to push you because we can see where you potentially can't see yet. And so they dropped him at Tennessee State University. He walked onto the football team, <laughs> dragging and screaming. The coach didn't even want him, but he really wanted to play. Um, and then they pushed him and they helped him really develop and focusing less on football and more on character. Um, and because he was pushed so hard and he had that kind of community of people around him, he was able to excel. Um, in, in his academics, but also um, in his football career. And he went on um, to be, you know, from an amazing kind of underdog experience, uh, starting off as an underdog all the way through being a significant underdog, the very last uh, draft pick for in the NFL, uh, to having a Super Bowl ring on his finger the next year, his very first year in the NFL. He um, was the MVP of the 1985 uh, Chicago Bears. Uh, championship. So the point is that what he talks about to this day and his football coach walks him into the Hall of Fame, his football coach at Tennessee State University. And what he said is this man made me into a man, not a great football player. This man loved me and cared about me. He called me in the middle of the night. Him and his wife gave me rides to and from work on the weekends. And that's the opportunity. I think that so many people have in HBCU environments. It's not unique to my husband. Most of the people I know who have attended HBC experiences have stories just like that one, which is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I, I'd really like us to dig into this, this, this idea of, of future strategies for achieving social justice. Um, so, so and, and, and I know um, um, Dr. Vincent has, has some particular experiences um, and, and, and really all of our panelists in terms of their ideas around um, entrepreneurship, leadership and you know and, and so how these different approaches to um, um the music industry or or the entertainment industry or education um in, in the 21st century sort of looks different and, and and black people are now being able to leverage their opportunities in ways that they had in the past can we talk a little bit about that yeah, uh, Dr. Robinson, let me just say amen to what everything that's been said. And there, and, and, and Sister Jones is so, so right about there, there are these incredible stories from HBCUs. We certainly have stories of success at predominantly white institutions, but there's something special about that HBCU experience. Um, I had the joy of sending two of my children HBCUs, one to Spelman, one to Morehouse. And they said, they both said it was a transformative experience for, uh, for them. And, and so let, let me just hit on a couple of points and, and tie a few things together. The, the, the first is this notion of structural racism and wealth creation. Um, we have to call out the fact that it's the government that had an active role in frustrating the experiences of African-Americans to own property and to build intergenerational wealth. We cannot ignore that. I mean, that, we could go on and on about that. Fortunately, another part of the Civil Rights Act was to directly address residential segregation and 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 many scholars have even referred to it as american apartheid right so we we have to talk about that and since since property is the most important way people build wealth we have to have a laser focus on that the other thing that's so impressive to me 
um, and, and you know, someone mentioned the music industry, and let, let's take rap for and hip hop for just one example. One of the things, and now growing up in New York City, I, I, I grew up during the birth of the hip hop movement. I think one of the most important things that happened is the move from being just performers to being entrepreneurs. And, and, and so many of you remember what Jay-Z said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man, right? And I think it's critical that we talk about that entrepreneurship and for, for brothers like um, uh, um, President Hammond and for so many young people, this notion of entrepreneurship. One of the things that we uh, instill in our children is that you got to start a business. You know, you have to start your own business and develop that entrepreneurship early on, buy property as mentioned earlier. So that, so I think that's an important strategy. I also think we got to come together collectively. You know, we, we often um, forget our greatness. And, and, and one of the things I try to do with our young people, my mentees, is, is, is instill that God-given greatness that's already there. You know, so it's not like we got to manufacture it. It's already there. We just have to tap in. And if we can connect with that collective greatness, I think that's really critical. So mentorship is such an important thing. And if each of us as, as um, established professionals, if we take one young person, two better, three even better, and actively mentor them and make sure they're on the right course. I tell all of my young people, and I'll say it to you, Brother Hammond, get yourself a board of directors, get yourself a group of, of people who are invested in your success and are committed uh, to your, that will hold you accountable and, and help you achieve your goals, right? So I think that's critical as well. The other thing is, and I, and because I, I want to defer to, to others, is we have to tell the truth. Too often we want to, we, we have gotten into a, a Alice in Wonderland kind of existence where facts aren't facts anymore. We have to tell the truth. And and I think it was um, Dr. Tyner who mentioned this notion of the six, well, the 1619 project and of course the backlash there, but we have to tell the truth. And that's one of the most patriotic things we can do. Tell the truth, advocate, mentor, honor our, our institution. So I just wanted to kind of lay that groundwork. And I, I do want to, I do want to um, really delve into this idea of cutting edge, um, you know, social justice strategies. Um, so, if you if you all could speak to 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 some of those and, and how you are engaged in those strategies or or, or aware of those strategies. Uh, well, I think uh, for my generation, a lot of things now in media and the entertainment industry. One good example I can use, we was the semifinal. Brooklyn Necklace didn't even the Brooklyn Nets didn't even show up to the game, uh, and and they were showing a symbol of protesting of everything that was going on. So I think that was something that we could do. Uh, other than, you know, just thinking protesting is the only option, like Dr. Uh, said, that's, that's not the only tool. There's so many other tools. If you look at uh, the entertainment industry when it comes to rap and hip hop, uh, yeah. a, a famous artist, Little Baby, uh, uh, made a song called Bigger Picture. And in Bigger Picture, he talked about all the racial uh, injustice and everything uh, that's going on with police brutality. And he, he talks about, yes, I'm a rapper, but I still encourage my people to vote. So, you know, using uh, his platform to shine a light on everything that's going on. And, um, and that's something that us millennials, we listen to. That's probably the number one artist that majority of Alabama State students listen to. And for them to hear that song and for us to be able to play that song in our car, you know, and, and play that song in the cab, that's just spreading awareness because we're rapping we're rapping the song but we're not really listening to what we listen to unless we okay let me run that back like when i heard the, the song the first time i was like okay he's like dropping knowledge you know so that's another thing that i think we're doing uh and and another thing is you know buying black uh when everything has been going on uh through you know america a lot of our millennials a lot of our students you know they created little formats little one sheeters of black businesses to you know go support in the city of montgomery or black businesses just to support in general um i remember you know my freshman year my orientation teacher she told me the same poem that they can teach you uh with a, a poem i can so our own 
uh, and, and you know, attention to her own, I think that's something uh, that that's good for change. Um, Ms. Jones or, 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 or Dr. Tyner, you could jump into this conversation, please. And I know you have a lot to say actually about this topic. I think that I, I agree. And I think I, I love Mr. Hammond, the, the, the examples that you gave. And it's not just millennials who <laughs> like the baby. <laughs> but, I do think that, but I do think that it's important, right, that we, that we think about kind of the intersection and where it is that black folks are just like Jay-Z said, we're a business, man. Like we are a business. We are a culture. We have we look at look at K-pop. We have Korean folks mimicking black culture, literally the entire world. And so part of the huge opportunity here is for us to be fully aware of the fact that we're, it's not just about individual acts, it's about collective acts, it's about collective consciousness and intentionality, and we are literally able to transform culture. We're creating culture and we're transforming culture, not just in the United States, but the entire world. But it means that we have to be intentional, right? So to take to take those important songs, like Bigger Picture, and then say, all right, now how do we transform this into a strategy? What are we gonna do with this? Not just turn it up louder, not just listen to it one more time, but how are we gonna actually use this to affect our choices about where we spend money, about how it is that we invest um, and what institutions we invest with, right? All of those sorts of things that are actually about how it is that we um, share our voices with our future employers. We, if you, if you have a generation of graduates who say, we are going to actively only look to work with employers who are willing to say and make commitments around, not just statements, but in actual actions, right? Things that are measurable, demonstrable, right? And over time, then that will transform things. Right now, I spend all my time talking to people who are hiring, say, we can't find black folks. We desperately want to hire black folks, desperately, everyone. And I'm like, I know a whole lot of black folks. Maybe they don't know about you because you're not doing what it is that needs to be done in order to promote who you are and the fact that your workplace environment is going to be equitable. It's going to allow for advancement opportunities. It's going to have active mentoring. It's going to have opportunities for promotion and visibility and career development. But if, we, if you as a whole generation of young people say, we are going to collectively make a statement that we are only going to work with employers who have these sorts of things in place for us, they will listen. They are desperately wanting to figure out how it is that they can respond to the expectations that are being put to them. Right, so I have I have huge companies saying our external partners, right, our vendors are holding us to a standard that if we don't actually show that our representation data, specifically around African Americans, has changed significantly within a very small window of time, then we are going to be held accountable financially speaking, right? And so they're desperate to actually find ways to 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 make some progress. And so this is a this is a wonderful time to make some demands to think about what our strategy is collectively. Um, Dr. Dr. Tyner, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, movement building? Uh, in, 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 I think you're in a unique position in that you are teaching people and, and organizing around the idea of, of, of empowering people to effectuate social change. Yes. When I think about movement building, it first starts with consciousness and thinking about what, what we know about who we are and from whence we come. People often say, well, Dr. Tyner, how did you say that in a public setting? You said it was so much. One woman said, I just want your confidence. I, I don't need confidence when I know who I am for, and from whence I come. So I think a part of my work has really been focusing on how do we understand our cultural history and our cultural roots? When we think about that, and I'll just link together everything I just heard as a response to this last question. We first know then that collectively, yes, we know based upon laws and policies and redlining and discrimination that we have a disproportionate rate of poverty. We know that's by design, by structural racism. I understand that. But when I step back and say, okay, what do I do with what's in front of me? And that maybe that's what my grandmother taught me. She didn't have much and she's, she was from Alabama. She taught us to use what you have. And when I look at what we have collectively, over a trillion dollars of buying power, what are we doing with it? 
And I learned that lesson to look at it critically, traveling all the way to Ghana to come back for movement building. I was at the slave castle in Cape Coast. And I remember seeing this man. And I said, he must be black Jesus. He was had these beautiful locks. We even have to challenge our imagery. So he had these beautiful locks. And I was like a shea butter on his face and his skin. There's something about him. So I walked up to him. I didn't know that he was Dr. Obadeli, uh, the acclaimed professor from the University of Ghana. And we walked up to him. It was another young student, uh, Mr. Ham is age from Alabama as well. And it just by circumstance, it all tied together. And the young man said, what do we do about civil rights? What do we do about human rights? What are we? And he was listing all these issues. And Dr. Obadeli said two key words that changed my life. He said, divest and invest. And when he talked about divest, I had to step back and say, how am I using my resources to help build this sense of consciousness around movement building. And then he also, with the invest, he and then he went a little further. He said, how is it that we will break our necks to get uh, a Lexus or the new Range Rover and no one buys a Katung? And I'm looking at him like, I don't even know what a Katung is. Ghana made, Black Star in the emblem of the vehicle. Why am I bringing this up? Because we can take intentional actions, but we have to have a consciousness around it and a strategy to think about what are the key issues that we're seeking to address? And I'll give you one personal example. I could spend my whole life thinking about all my clients who did not learn how to read until they were in prison. And I believe my big constitutional law case will be, and I have to connect up with Dr. Vincent on this one. How did they enjoy due process when they can't even spell due process? So when we think about this specifically, when 60 to 80% of the prison population cannot read, we can say it's a shame, we can say that's interesting, or we can pull up our sleeves. Movement building is about taking action when we see it, and that's what I decided to do. I took my experience from working in other publishing companies. I built a publishing house because I tried to go through the major publishers. The answer was, no, we're not interested. We're not sure if African-Americans purchase books. I mean, it was highly offensive. And then I thought, get away from the offense and get into a movement. And it was a movement that became over time. I started to write diverse children's books. You see a few of them behind me and focusing on the African-American experience. It became a movement because to now, if you follow the hashtag, what do you see? We need diverse books and own books as hashtags to say that we want books with black characters at the center. Data, movement building is following data, building metrics and progress. We must then challenge the data when it's more likely to see a black dog or a black bear on the cover of a book than a black girl or a black boy. That's data driven. That's not Dr. Tyner talking. So new movement building must be intentional. And I also would add the component that it is global and it connects the dots. I can't talk about criminal justice if I don't talk about the brutality that started at the slave castles and being put in the condemned cell, left there until you die for having the daring idea that you were born to be free and not enslaved chains. So when I think about this, movement building starts with consciousness and then starts with outlining a clear vision on what we're seeking to accomplish and developing the strategies to make that vision come alive. Wow. I, I, I think um, one of the components that, that, that or one of the approaches that we've talked about or touched on, again, is entrepreneurialism. But I think that both, um, um, Deanna Jones and Dr. Tyner both have an interest in, in, in women in um, entrepreneurship. If, if you all could speak to um, some initiatives along those lines. Well, for me, I, um, I mentioned earlier that I actively discriminate, which I have no shame in my game about. Um, I look for black folks to work with, to hire, I, to, as, as, as contractors, as W2 employees, wherever I can actively. That's not, that's not every single person, but I always 100% look actively for where it is that I can identify um, other black folks to support and to collaborate with in all sorts of ways. But I also actively look for women. And if I can um, actively find and support black women, that's even more powerful. I think black women are particularly um, strong and solid and, um, and, and educated and competent. 
Um, that has been my experience <laughs> of myself and of all black women I know. And so one of the things that I think is really important is as a woman and as a black woman to actively say, this is the commitment that I'm going to make, not just to myself and for myself, but to other black women and then do it. Because one of the other things that has come out of this horrible kind of legacy of slavery and oppression is that sometimes we experience and then perpetrate internalized oppression. We divide ourselves. We hold each other to higher standards than we hold other people to, that we are hard on ourselves. Um, and so, you know, somebody said in the chat, right, that, you know, we, we don't actively invest in black businesses because we think that, you know, white folks, uh, water is colder and their sugar is sweeter. The same thing with black women. We need to actively look for and support each other and let go of all of those things that have been divisive and just the, you know, kind of the, the chains of oppression that have bound us for too long. Did you want to speak um, to that, Dr. Tyner? You, you unmute your mic, Dr. Tyner. Unmute your mic, Dr. Tyner. Let's see, try again. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. I think it's the hope for the future. Women, if we look at our strengths, it tends to be that we can create, that we can multitask, and that we can build. We know the age-old proverb that tells us even as we educate a woman, we educate a nation. So we want to make sure that women are at the forefront of creating their own change. And if you don't see it, uh, travel throughout the streets anywhere on the continent of Africa, you see women who are merchants who are carrying their store on their back. And when I think about that as a source of inspiration, I know that there's too hard or nothing impossible because they do that from early morning to late at night. So when I think about women entrepreneurs, here's one thing that I wanna challenge everyone about. We talk about pay equity, it tends to be about white women and job opportunities. Let's put our sisters in the forefront of that conversation and we will be dismayed. How is it still yet in 2020, it will take me to get up hard with white males a whole nother half of a year into August to have pay parity. So I want to say, let's not just end this conversation around entrepreneurship. Let's end it with a sense of making sure that we're addressing structural racism as it relates to black women in the workplace to promote the fairness. And I know Dr. Vincent made this very clear. We think about justice and I don't know why I'm even having this conversation. If we know that there are laws against discrimination, we know the EEOC regulates these things. How is it that I still go into organizations as a consultant and see that black women are grossly underpaid? It's unacceptable. We have a few minutes left in, in this part of our conversation. I'd like each, to afford each one of you a minute, really to give us your final thoughts on, on today's topic. And let's let's start with um, let's let's start with with, the, with Dr. Tyna, move to Doc, uh, Dr. Vincent, uh, Mrs. Jones, and then Mr. Hammond. My final thought is. And this is a message directly to the young people who are listening in. I challenge you to know yourself. If you need courage to bring forth change, learn something about Yahya Santiwa, who said, if the men won't go to fight against the British, we will keep our golden stool in Ashanti kingdom. We will keep our power because the women will go out and fight. If you're not sure what direction to go about innovation, start where you are. Dr. Wangari Matai told us if we plant one tree, we are planting hope. Over 50 million trees were planted as a result of her first effort of taking one step. So I want you to understand, and as, as Dr. Vincent talked about having that board of directors, I want you to have a Justice League as a part of that as well. Those heroes and sheroes that will inspire you and know that this is more than just one tool in your toolbox. You have more than protesting. You have more than boycotting. These are essential. Use those. I'm not negating their power, but I want you to use the power of entrepreneurship. I want you to use the power of civic engagement, and I want you to use your voice and live it for justice. Thank you. So the first thing is to be a, a, a passionate advocate for the permanent interest of your community and your people. Two, 
connect to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, uh, in Africa, the Caribbean, and, and other places part of the diaspora. They need us and we need them. We have to uh, advocate and protect and, and, and honor our institutions um, that have benefited us and, and have allowed us to get through uh, these um, all of these significant challenges yesterday, today, and the present. We must have faith. Dr. King said we must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Faith has to undergird everything we do. We have to build positive, authentic community, and we must always advocate and tell the truth. For me, one of the things that I'd like to um, leave you with is the idea of uh, figuring out where it is that we're trying to go, right? We know what's broken. We know that structural racism exists. We know that oppression exists. We know that we know that uh, black folks in the United States and in many parts of the world have been uh, significantly oppressed. Um, and, and so knowing that and understanding that is incredibly important. There's no question about it. But now my hope is that we also kind of simultaneously as we are learning about and understanding the, the, the past, we are also creating a clear and compelling vision of our future. Where is it that we are actually trying to go? What is our ask? What are we trying to achieve? I feel like there is a lot of uh, a lot of time there's energy around articulating and, and fighting over things that are broken. And then when people who actually have power say, well, what is the ask? We're not able to articulate something, right? And so what is it that we're actually asking for? What is it that we actually want to build? What do we want to create? What do we want to have full agency over? And if we can come into a collective understanding and agreement about that and then create the strategic path towards it, that's, I think, the most powerful way that we can uh, really bring our energy together right now and and capitalize on the moment where so many of us are so kind of righteously um, connected to um, a really important agenda and also where we have the whole world potentially supporting this effort. Can you target them? Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, we have one more um, person um, to, 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 to do a wrap up. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Uh, first off, I would like to just, you know, thank everyone, thank the panel, uh, three panelists and our moderator. You know, I've learned so much in this short time, and I wish we could continue to go on. But, you know, to my peers uh, and to the, the younger younger people, you know, I leave you with uh, create uh, create change, create awareness, and create your own. You know, create change. If you don't see a change uh, that you want to see, then create it. Uh, create awareness with our peers, you know of everything that's going on then you should everything that's going on in them but also uh let our younger generations under us be aware of what's going on and educate them and create your own you know be able to have something that you can call your own uh that can't be taken away from you uh we're standing on the shoulders of giants so i i, I definitely want us to progress uh, and have us moving forward in everything. But once again, I thank everyone uh, for today. And be before we leave, I, the, we do have a, a series of questions and we have about five minutes to, to, to ask and answer a couple of questions. I'd like to turn to, um, <sighs> let's look at, let's look at um, Ernest Claiborne. Ernest Claiborne wrote a question and he, he, he addressed it to me, but I really think it's more appropriate for the panel. And that is, is criminal justice reform viewed as a civil rights issue? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, that has to be part of our system. When you look at this historically, uh, we see that the criminal justice system was used uh, to, uh, to continue to enslave black people, certainly post the uh, reconstruction. And that has continued. And we know the disproportionate impact of criminal justice on uh, the African-American community. So absolutely criminal justice has to be an essential part of any civil rights agenda. 
We have a question from a Riley Barnes, and he asked, um, do you think it is important in this time for blacks and minorities to attend HBCUs where they can be properly educated and supported concerning the issues we face today? The HBCU student myself, I do think it is the you. And I, I tell my friends so much of them, you know, they, they attend Clemson, they attend these other universities. I tell them that same class you can get at Clemson and at this school, you can get at Alabama State University, but you're going to get so much more within that class. So um, I definitely feel like it, it is important because you're around your people. And your people, we have some of the same issues, some of the same concerns day in and day out. And to be able to sit in the cab, to be able to sit in your uh, African-American humanities class and, and discuss those issues is so beautiful. Rather than being um, rather being just a, a, a number at these big prestigious colleges. You know, a famous um, worker here at Alabama State says that Alabama State were small enough to know you and big enough to grow you. So I believe that at all HBCUs, they're small enough to know you and big enough to grow you into whoever you want to be. So I definitely feel like it's important. I'd like to, um, well, someone asked, uh, and I don't see a name, but someone asked, um, if Dr. Tyner could go back and just reiterate some of the examples she gave of systemic racism. Yes, I'd, I'd be delighted to. I think it's looking back related to history. I alluded to it as we think about even uh, Dr. Vincent highlighted about housing and access to uh, property ownership. If we know that that's one of the great wealth builders, we also know that there was redlining that excluded who had access to what, when, and where in particular neighborhoods. In fact, in my state, those restrictive covenants are still on the books. So the University of Minnesota is going title by title in some of these deeds. And what you see is, if we look at it on the ground, all of a sudden, those houses that were in those restrictive covenant areas, and I can tell you because I'm looking at real estate trends all the time, they're worth a million or more. You take the house with the same square footage and pieces across and, and what they would consider inner city areas, you're barely at $150,000. And if we go back to my history related to Rondo, African-Americans can't afford to live in Rondo anymore because of gentrification. So when we look at the piece of systemic racism, it's not about one individual in the closet, the boogeyman racist. It's about policies and procedures that decide who to exclude and who to include. And if we connect it to criminal justice really quickly, Minnesota has a lot of policies that restrict access to licensure, to jobs, and even related to voting if someone has been convicted of a felony, even if they're not in secure detention. They could be a part of a diversion program or be home on probation or parole. Until they're off paper, for example, they cannot vote in the state of Minnesota. So when I think about this, these are systems to exclude a particular group of people, which not by happenstance are African-Americans. That dilutes our power in the electoral process and democracy. That dilutes our power related to economics. So when I look at this, you can't say it's about a person. It's about a system that influences who has power and how they maintain it. We have a question from um, William R. Ford. And he asks, how can we make young people of color understand that the two party voting process in America is digital, ones and zeros? Our advancement in America has been incremental to use a football analogy, three yards and a cloud of dust. For instance, still always looking to throw a bomb downfield. We sometimes have to choose the best option, not the perfect option. A third party vote or a no vote is a vote for the current administration. Would anybody like to respond to that observation? So I think that uh, when we talk about citizenship, there are rights and responsibilities. One of the most sacred responsibilities you have as a citizen of this country is to vote and to be fully engaged and informed in the issues. And you have to use this, and I'll go a step further, you have to, to uh, use your vote to advance the permanent interest of your community. And, uh, and, and that transcends party. So whatever organization 
uh, or party best address that and hold those party members, those elected officials accountable. But to be informed, to be engaged, not because one of the things we've not talked about is the active attack on black people participating in our democratic society. So when we talk about the digital issue, I'm much more concerned about the attacks and the disinformation that's being uh, that's being applied to the black community. We have to resist that individually and collectively. We have a question from Mrs. Booms, third grade class. Um, and this is directed to the SGA president. How would you take student activism into the beloved community? Do you feel that volunteerism should be a part of your studies? Well, that is a great uh, question, Mrs. Bonner, class. Um, I think student activism, uh, take it into our community a lot. Uh, Dr. Ross has done a great job with branding community uh, and, and being a part of our community, which is Montgomery, Alabama. But we have some great student leaders who um, want better for our generation, who want better for not only stay for the city of Montgomery, um, oh, different organizations are, they just want to be an activist uh, for better. And uh, volunteerism, uh, it, it definitely could be uh, a part of our studies. Um, you know, everyone uh, needs a little help and needs a little assistance in a kind of heart. My SGA treasurer uh, is big on that. Uh, every week he has a project for us to go out into the community uh, and have some type of uh, volunteerism, volunteering impact on the Montgomery community as well. One last question. Um, given the current economic and population climate, the 40 acres and a mule concept no longer works. What would you consider reparations to look like today? No one wants to touch that one? Oh, uh, well, yeah. I, I, wanted, I wanted to defer to my, my panelists, but yeah, I mean, just very quickly, there's a compelling case for reparations. There's a compelling case for, uh, and we can put that in economic terms about what it would, uh, how would we address systemic racism? Uh, that is part of a larger discussion. And, and I think that you could have an, another panel with experts who could talk on that issue. But the simple answer is yes, reparations is real. It's, it, it would be part of a, a justice remedy uh, to uh, uh, to address the systemic racism um, that Black people have faced since the beginning um, of this uh, democracy. I don't I, have, I don't have um, a super cohesive kind of uh, quick answer, but I do also just want to point out, and it's 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 uh, kind of indicative of some of the major uh, shifts that are happening right now. That the state of California just put together a task force to really look deeply uh, at this issue of reparations. Um, as well as some other things that are happening at that um, state level. So it is interesting to see that the momentum around reparations specifically is not getting lost and that there are active, kind of this active pursuit of how it is that those should manifest themselves. So I do think that something pretty compelling is going to take form. And I just wanna say, I agree. It's a part of the work that's emerging right here in Rondo in looking at our land trusts, looking at the impact of gentrification and building our baseline economics. So there is an agenda that's set forth. And I just close with just briefly, it's important to have an agenda. We oftentimes just think our task ends at the ballot box, but we have to then hold the politicians and those who represent us accountable to the agenda. Now I haven't listened to his music yet, Mr. Hammond, but Killer Mike, every time he's on a stage, I notice he says the same thing. So what I'm looking for and a part of my work, I lead the Center on Race Leadership and Social Justice at the University of St. Thomas, is that I can hope nationally that we have convenings like this and come up with like a 10 point plan. That way we're one choir, we're all on the same hymnal, we might sing soprano, you know, somebody else might be better as a tenor, but I know that I have a common ask for my brothers and sisters across the nation and around the world. So I would hope that we can come together with that agenda. Thank you, thank you for our, um, um, audience who provided those questions. Thank you for our panelists who provided these, these penetrating um, discussion. Um, thank you for 
um, participation. We're going to now turn to our closing remarks by Dr. Kevin Roll, Chief of Staff for Alabama State University. Thank you. Thank you. Not often do you get the opportunity to bring a group of panelists together who has such vast knowledge in social justice. I happen to share a connection with all three of you. One as a ACE fellow, one as my former graduate colleague, and one as a former, my former national president of one of the most outstanding organizations in this country. Given what's going on in this country today, it is obvious that we need to do more of this. We need to have these conversations in order to help our young folks, our peers, our colleagues, African-Americans and minorities understand the plight ahead of them. Ahead of them. I would say to you that it's very important that you exercise your freedom on November 3rd of this year. Uh, I will say to you also, you must continue to spread the word about what's important, what's just, what's fair, and what you have to do to succeed in this country. It is very important, very important, and it goes without saying, that what's going on right now is very unusual. This pandemic, the things that's going on in Washington, in this nation, in this country, is very vital to our survival. I'm extremely concerned about children, future grandchildren, and the future of this country. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. On behalf of Alabama State University, where we take a rock and make it a diamond, thank you again on behalf of us. God bless you.